Great. So folks, uh, thanks for sticking around. We hope you enjoy this evening's program um, as a follow-up to the Kaler Science Lecture. Um, we always are following these up with a special edition of our Prairie Skies program, which is a tour of the night sky. And we highly encourage you folks to uh, pop into the chat and ask us questions. Uh, we had good questions in both the chat and the Q&A, and we're going to allow both of those to be available to you all. That's fine. Uh, just remember that if there are things that you want your uh, fellow audience members to see, make sure to change the two from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. Okay, um, so that way they can all see what you have to say there. Um, and remember that if you hover, uh, oh, actually, yeah, it's a little tougher to rename yourselves when you can't actually see the attendee list. Um, but if you reach out to the panelists and uh, ask a question, I've actually renamed a couple of you so that uh, we can do a better job at recording who your instructor is so we can share that information with them so that you can get that extra credit that you uh, earned for being with us tonight. Okay, so I'm going to put Waylena on the spotlight for all of this. Uh, she, you'll, you can see her in the dome. She'll talk about that probably a little bit. And she's going to share images actually generated by our Digistar projection system. Um, normally it goes up onto the dome, but now it's going to be going onto Zoom. Okay. All right. Well, Waylena, take her away. Hi, everyone. This is Waylena, and I'm here in the Starco Planetarium. And I can honestly say I wish you were all here with me right now uh, because the dome is very, uh, very empty these days. We've been able to have parkland classes uh, here, but um, not public or school groups, uh, but we've had astronomy classes and we had weather class in here this week. That was so wonderful. I got to do those programs with uh, Julie Angel, just always, uh, always an absolute joy. I, I treasure those, uh, those occasions. So I'm here in the planetarium and uh, I've got it set up. I'm gonna share the screen, but I did wanna point out, oh, I forgot. Ah, oh, your dome. Yes. yes, I forgot my top. Mini dome. Yes, a mini dome. So normally what we see is uh, kind of like looking inside of this uh, bowl here. This is a much smaller version of the 50 foot diameter screen that's over my head. But that means that when we show it on the screen, what we're seeing is a circular image inside of a square. So now I'll go ahead and share the screen and switch it over to that. See if I can get it there. All right. Now I've already put the sky in progress. So uh, this was the sky earlier this evening. So I can, uh, oh, I can back it up a little bit. I'm looking at the, the date screen off to the side. I'm closing my Zoom windows so that they're not in the way. All right, so this was about, uh, about three or four hours ago, three hours ago. There we go, I had to do the math in my head on it. And, <laughs> I started us off uh, facing the south so that we could see some of the wintertime uh, famous star patterns. Just wonderful to see. And uh, the wintertime sky, just beautiful, bright stars. And it's still getting dark early so that you don't have to stay up so late. Although, honestly, this week it's going to be so cold that mm, if I look at the sky, I'm going to be looking out from a window and I'm gonna be all bundled in nice warm blankies while I do it because it's very, very cold out there this week. And of course we're gonna have snow for part of that too. Uh, so here in the uh, central portion going up in the sky, we have the most famous of all the star patterns. And I'm going to maneuver the screen a little bit so we can zoom in some. And I can change the tilt. Here we go. Move it just a little bit. There we go. 
All right. So Orion, very famous for uh, bright stars for the shoulders and for the legs. But it's these three stars in a row that really make it stand out. And of course, it's the belt of Orion. So Orion has shoulders and legs and is wearing a belt. And we can imagine all sorts of different things in this star pattern. But the most famous have been uh, human figures. And I've got some of my favorite examples that I can share. Let's see, let's get the Let's get the traditional Orion picture first. There we see he's got a club and he's got a shield. In this case, it's animal skins. And looks like he's going to start swinging that at some of the brighter stars. But uh, I, I, I think we can come up with some other pictures too. So let's see. We've had... Uh, Lots of hunters and mighty warriors. Now these images, by the way, were drawn by our artist photographer who was with us here for many years, Pam Fries. She also taught astronomy classes and uh, uh, she's been retired for a few years, but her images are just still so much fun. And uh, I'm so excited still to be able to share them. Now there are other, uh, other non-human figures that we can imagine. And I always like this one a lot. So what is that? Dog biscuit, dog bone. When we have this one, sometimes we get little arguments in the dome with the kids. Some will say it's a bow tie. Some will just say it's a it's a bow, and and you know they're 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 gonna fight over it. Well, I think it can be either way, but I do I do have I do like it as a bow tie because bow ties are cool. But this is my favorite. And I remember uh, one year. Uh, um, kid said, oh, what kind of butterfly is that? And uh, another little one, actually a very little one piped up and said a cartoon one. And you know, she wasn't wrong. And whether you call it an hourglass or a timer, uh, it, it works out. So you can look at these same star patterns in the sky. And maybe you can imagine the pictures the way people imagined them years ago. But, you know, if you can imagine your own pictures, that is just as fun, sometimes even more fun, I think. Now, those belt stars of Orion are great for helping us to find other stars. For instance, if we go to the three stars of the belt, and we draw the imaginary line and we draw it down toward the, toward the left. And this will be toward the east. I know we don't have the directional letters up, but we get to the brightest of the nighttime stars. So the only star we see brighter than that is our daytime star, the sun. And let me go ahead and tilt the view down. And we can check out that star some more. The star's name is Sirius. And for Harry Potter fans, you might recognize the name Sirius. Well, Sirius is also called the dog star. And it's the brightest star, not only in the nighttime sky, but in the constellation of Canis Major, the large dog. And I do have a large dog that I can show. Now, if you're wondering, we have a large dog, Canis Major. Is there a Canis Minor? Yep, there sure is. And it's made of two stars. And they're over here. A pretty bright star and then one that's not so bright. But that's it, two stars. Two stars 
two stars to make a little dog. And so we like to have some fun with that. Maybe, oh, what kind of dog is that? Yeah, I should ask what you like on your hot dog, but that's something else that people get all excited about, you know. Do you put on mustard? Do you put uh, chili? Do you put onions? I know, I know it can be a, it can be a fun one, but uh, it, 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 it's a lot of fun to imagine these star patterns in different ways. And if you've only got two stars to work with, uh, hot dog makes sense to me, but I do have a puppy dog I can share. It's so cute. So those are the hunting dogs of Orion, the hunter. But mm, the more I think about it, the more I think that's what our dogs are really after in our sky. Although I have seen dogs chase butterflies too. That's always fun. Now going back up to the stars of Orion. We'll tilt our view again. If we go to those three stars and we follow them up in the opposite direction, we get to this V-shaped group of stars. The bright star in the bunch is called Aldebaran and it's sort of an orangish, uh, orangish red star. Um, Star color is kind of neat because it gives us an idea of the star's temperature. Red and orange stars are the least hot stars and then blue and blue white stars are the hottest. Uh, yellow stars like our sun are just kind of medium, kind of in between. But, um, Aldebaran is there with that V-shaped group and that V-shaped group makes the face of another constellation. This one is Taurus the bull. So I'll get a Taurus picture up there for us. Now you notice if you keep going past the V shape, we get to this wonderful, wonderful group of stars. It's a star cluster and it's called the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. And um, you know, if you see it with just your eyes, you're gonna see maybe six or seven stars in that bunch. Um, I've only ever seen six, but it looks like an itty bitty, teeny tiny little micro dipper. It's not one of the dippers, but it is a really nifty sight. And if you've got binoculars, they don't have to be super high power binoculars, uh, the kind that you would use for bird watching. And we have a few of those at home. We certainly do. Uh, you know, check it out. Uh, even if you're inside looking out through a window, I did that a lot when I was a kid when it's too cold to go outside. Um, so definitely check those out. And I don't know how many of you have Subaru vehicles, but next time you see one, look at the uh, look at the emblem, the symbol for it, because those stars are the ones for in that emblem, because another word for that group of stars is Subaru. So uh, yeah, my folks have a Subaru. So I thought that was always a neat thing. Well, let me get this picture down because right now, it's not always there, but this year it is. Right now we have this wonderful red thing that looks like a red star, but it's not. Yep, the planet Mars. So excited about Mars. Got a whole bunch of cool Mars stuff that uh, uh, we're going to take a look at here in a moment. But since we're not quite done with the sky yet, I'll just do some planetarium magic, zoom it up, and I'll turn it around so that we can see it better. I know it's easier here in the dome when we can all just look at the same thing at the same time. There, we can make it bigger. So there are uh, three Mars missions in progress on their way to Mars. And um, they launched last summer during the, uh, during what they call the launch window. It's when Mars and Earth are positioned just right to be able to launch spacecraft and have the least time to get from Earth to Mars. 
And so that was last July. And so there are three different missions. They're all going to be arriving here in this month. Um, one of them is uh, just an orbiter. And I say just an orbiter, but oh my goodness, do you know how hard it is to get things into space, to get them all the way to Mars, to have them survive the whole way, and then to uh, survive going into orbit? I mean, it, it, it takes some doing. Um, so that's, uh, uh, there's one is an orbiter, another is going to be a lander, that's the one that we're going to focus mostly on, and a third is going to uh, go into orbit and then later on we'll release a lander. So uh, we'll mention all three of those, but we'll, we'll spend more time on the one that's going to be a landing, but I'm not done with the sky yet, so I'm going to zoom us out. And I'm going to turn us around to face north. And that is way faster than we would do it if we were here in the planetarium. I promise you, we would not do it that quickly, no matter how much the kids would ask for it. Wanted to go ahead and cover a little bit with the directions and, of course, the most famous of the start patterns. You know the one, let me get a sip of water here. Let's see, there's seven stars. Seven stars, seven stars in the Northern sky. What could they be? There, now we can see them better. Well, of course, we're talking about the Big Dipper. And I can go ahead and put the uh, lines up for that. The Big Dipper is a wonderful group of stars. The stars all seem to be about the same in brightness. So they, they really stand out together. And this time of year, we see them up in the Northeast. And then through the night, they get higher and higher and higher. It's a really neat thing. Now, what's helpful for us with the Big Dipper are these two stars. I'll go ahead and take the picture down. There we go. These two stars, we draw an imaginary line between them and then we stretch it out and it reaches that star. And I'll go ahead and use the effect that we have in the planetarium. Boom, just like that. That is the North Star, real name Polaris, which means pole star. And if we were at the North Pole, that star would always be straight overhead at the tippy top middle of the sky. Well, of course, we're not at the North Pole. So I know it's going to feel like it for the next week or so. It's going to be so cold. Um, but we do always see it in the same spot in the sky. And uh, if we measure how high it is above the north, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, always right around 40 degrees. Not exactly, but really close. And the fun thing is that it gives us a really close approximation of our latitude, our position in degrees, degrees of a circle, uh, from the uh, from the equator. It's a really neat thing. So the farther north we go, the higher it is. The farther south we go, the lower it gets. If we're at the equator, then it's right along the horizon. And if we're in the southern hemisphere, we don't see it. Now the sky works the same way. There is a spot in the southern hemisphere sky that stays put, that all the stars go around but there doesn't happen to be a bright star in that spot. So the sky does work the same way. Uh, it's just that in the Northern hemisphere, we have a star in that spot. So that's why we get a North star. Now that North star does not stand out so well on its own. I mean, we've been talking about it, but without the lines up, kind of easy to forget which one it is that I'm talking about. Well, I can put its label up there. Or I could also put up the picture to show that it's the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper. And the Little Dipper is kind of big, just not as big as the Big Dipper. So there are the two dippers. Now, those two dippers are parts of the official constellation 
of the two bears and I'll get them into view and then I'll turn their pictures on. I don't know though, they don't really look like real bears. What do you think? Let me zoom it out just a bit so we can see the whole picture. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, one of them kind of looks like a squirrel or a skunk or I don't know. Maybe one of uh, one of my cats when they're scared and the you know, tail poops out. Um, the other one, well, I gotta turn my head here, but yeah, I don't know. I don't think they look like real bears, but it's okay. They're giant imaginary space bears, so. Yeah, heads are a bit off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they. I mean, the, they don't have those tails, so I. There's that, yeah. Yeah, so I. It, 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 it's fun though, it's fun. Um, but you know, if you imagine different things in those stars, that is a-okay as well. And people have imagined different <laughs> patterns in the uh, Big Dipper, especially for, uh, for just for, well, since as long as people have been looking at the sky, really. And, um, oh, I gotta show my favorite. I always like that one. Although at this time of year, I start to wonder, you know, well, gee, why wouldn't the eggs like slide out of the skillet? <laughs> <laughs> Ellie so. suggests that they could be raccoons or space cats. Well, space cats, yeah. I didn't show my shirt. There you go. It says, I need more, more Mars. Mars. There you go. I do like the alternate number. artwork that you have on the Constellations for Kids panel for, for the oh, two bears. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't preload that. I know, it, ta it takes a while to get that up, I understand. Yeah, they do look a little bit more like bears. Yeah, at least the heads are good. And it's just, I just love the art style to it. Um, yeah, that is kind of, that is kind of fun. I, do, I can show that. It's, it's going to look weird because it'll not be preloaded, but so why not? Because this is the last thing before we talk more about Mars stuff. So sure. we can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Yeah. So let me go ahead. Oh, boy, I have to take my glasses off to be able to see it because it's right down in there at the bottom. There you go. Yeah, that works great. They do look a bit more like bears, but they still, the tails don't work out. Uh, the little one looks very raccoony because the, the eyes. But raccoons look kind of bear like in the face. They're accommodating the star pattern. I understand. That's all good. I, I do love the shading on that art. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Mars. So uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, the mission I'm gonna talk about most is the, uh, um, the Mars 2020 mission. So this is the one that's been uh, put together mostly by NASA, but there's a lot of uh, international um, cooperation on these missions. And I'm just going to close out bunch of my digital stuff so that I can move other things onto the screen. And one of the things that I want to show is, well, I'll tell you, for anyone who's been here in the planetarium, you may have seen the wonderful uh, clip of the landing sequence from the Curiosity mission. Now, if you love Curiosity rover, Perseverance, which is the one that's part of the Mars 2020 mission, looks a lot like it. Um, similar dimensions, um, there a lot of Curiosity's um, equipment was um, a test for uh, what Perseverance is uh, about to do. Uh, Perseverance is a lot heavier though. It's heavier and it's going to be faster. Not faster, I mean, it's faster in the landing a little bit, but also faster all around because the, um, the, the artificial intelligence that they've designed for it to help make decisions as it moves about way faster because they're not gonna have to uh, pause as often to get information and signals back and forth between uh, Earth and Mars. So very excited about it. 
But if you remember that sequence, they've made one for Perseverance landing. It's not full dome though, but that kind of works out for us since we're not full dome right now. We're here on a Zoom screen. So I'm gonna move this over and I'll go ahead and full screen it and we can play this. I'm really excited about this, you guys. I sure am. And uh, I, I get so excited over the, I call it the jet pack. I mean, I know it's called the sky crane and because it will lower down the, uh, lowers the rover down uh, and then it, you know, releases it and takes off. But it's like, this thing has its own jet pack. Well, that's the same kind of, uh, um, same kind of uh, method that they used for the Curiosity rover. There is another difference for the landing sequence for, uh, well, not so much for the sequence. Um, it will be a little sped up because they do have a lot more detectors everywhere uh, for detecting the distance to the ground, looking over the terrain to um, avoid um, an landing in an area that's just too rough let me get some, uh, let me get a picture for you here. Oh, I can show this one. So this is just sort of a drawing of the different stages and uh, they've got little signals here showing that there's, you know, there, there's, uh, um, they're getting the, the range, the distance to the land. There's cameras in action. They've got it all going on here until they do drop it. But here, this, So what we saw in that animation was all art. It wasn't, uh, uh, the terrain was uh, taken from real images of the, uh, the Mars terrain. And of course the, the model of the spacecraft used for the animation was based on the, the, the real spacecraft. But the uh, previous mission did not have cameras in all these locations getting all those great shots. This does have those cameras, has cameras, uh, there's parachute lookup cameras, the uh, descent uh, stage down look camera, rover up look camera, down look camera, and a microphone. So we're going to actually get recording of what it sounds like coming through that thin atmosphere. This is really, really exciting stuff for a space nerd girl like me, I'll tell you what, uh, because I spent a lot of time imagining and trying to uh, create images of what these spaces would look like, and we're going to get the real thing. I haven't been this excited since uh, New Horizons was getting to Pluto, and we were finally getting to see what that looked like. Oh, so excited about this, you guys, so excited. So the, the mission itself, has a lot of really neat stuff going on. One of the things that uh, that they're going to have are uh, going to collect samples. Now, Curiosity does drilling as well, and this has a, a bigger drill and uh, is going to um, not only drill and take a lot of readings and send the information back, but it's going to take samples of, um, of the rock and, and the dust from the drilling. And it's going to place these samples into these tubes, which, well, it's kind of a, kind of a neat, this is just a diagram showing the different parts to it. But this picture shows you that it's, 
these tubes are the size of um, like a little flashlight, which of course I don't have my flashlight in here that is that same size. I should have done that as a prop, but yeah, it's the size of a little flashlight. And they're going to take all these samples in, in, in these special tubes and they're going to leave them. They're going to leave them in these tubes so that a future mission, a future mission can have um, either humans, more likely robots, that will go pick them up and then bring them to a, a sample return craft. So bring them back to earth, but not on this trip, not on this trip. And you might think, well, why not just wait and get the samples then? Well, I'm sure they will get the samples then, but this is kind of like, I think of, uh, what was it I called them, these little tubes? Oh yes, I called them, cute little adorable time capsules of Martian soil. Uh, so the soil and the dust and the little bits of rock that we put inside these tubes, we, that Perseverance Craft puts inside these tubes, right? When they get collected later, they can be studied as a snapshot of what it was like now. Now you think, well, what's the difference gonna be between now and what? four years from now, five, six years from now, whenever it'll be when they can get these samples picked up. Well, I don't know. How many spacecraft do we keep sending to Mars? Over time, the stuff that we send there will start to affect the samples that we get. And in fact, they have some uh, they have some tubes that, um, oh, what did they call them? Witness tubes, that's what they call them. Witness tubes, where while they get these samples, they're going to also be sampling uh, the, uh, the air right around the, uh, right around the craft as it's taking these samples to try and detect if anything from the rover, anything from Perseverance is, emitting any kind of uh, gases or flaking off bits of, uh, you know, earth dust or something. Uh, now, they've tried really hard to get this craft as clean as possible, and it's probably cleaner than any of the previous missions, but still, they want to be able to measure this, and they've thought this out very well, so I'm pretty excited about that as well. The uh, likely method of getting these samples back Oh, let me see if I can find uh, this next link. Here we go. It's called a fetch rover. I know, isn't that adorable? A fetch rover. And it's uh, uh, going to be with the uh, European Space Agency. And this would be a rover that doesn't have a huge heavy drill on it, but it runs around and uh, has an arm that's going to reach out, pick it up, collect it. Fetch Rover, what does it do? It fetches the samples that have been left behind for it. And then we'll take them to a craft that will lift off from Mars and bring the samples back to Earth. A fetch rover. I just thought that was the neatest, the neatest thing, and what a cute name for it. So, yep, I'm not, I'm not really so much a dog person. I got all these cats, but if I had, well, that's it. The next cat, yeah, my husband, if you, if he's on here listening, we're, our next cat, we're gonna name it Fetch, <laughs> or we're gonna name it Rover, and we're gonna make it Fetch things. There, that, that's what we can do for that. So, the landing is scheduled for. February 18th. And uh, another difference from Curiosity, Curiosity, that landing was in the middle of the night for us here in the central time zone, but this is going to be in the afternoon. So that's kind of, that's kind of a nice, a nice thing for us. Um, all the science stuff is not going to start right away. They're going to have to spend uh, possibly uh, even a well, definitely a month, but maybe longer, testing out a lot of the different pieces and parts to make sure that they're working okay. And let me get another picture here. Um, once they have that in place, then they do have 
a, uh, a path that they've charted out that they'd like for it to follow and they want to follow along. They don't want to get stuck in the sand, but they want to be able to check out lots of different types of terrain uh, along the way. And possibly the most, uh, oh, here's the other path I was looking for. There we go. I, I, I just love being able to compare the different pictures. There's a couple different possible exact landing sites and no matter what, they do want it to get over to that path that we just saw. Along the way, there is going to be, ah, they haven't said when, but they will at some point deploy, I love saying that, it just sounds so cool, deploy the helicopter. Yep, yep, they've got, it has a helicopter, and I'm trying to find my picture of it here. All right, this one's a good one because it shows it in flight and it's called Ingenuity. And uh, now this is purely experimental and if it works, it's got cameras and so they can scout out additional locations. Uh, it can send signals to the rover. It can also send the signals to the uh, craft that are in orbit around Mars, part of the Mars relay network. The, uh, the blades, are, um, I guess they're like carbon fiber coated, but a foam core to keep them really lightweight. This is so new and exciting and future, uh, future craft will have uh, uh, fine tune adjustments based on what they learn from this because that is a thin atmosphere. So folks aren't real sure how well it's going to do, but um, no, the, the tests indicate that it is so far, the ones they did on Earth, that uh, should be able to do okay, but nothing like knowing for sure. And here's how it's going to deploy, except I, I had the animation handy, but I don't have that now. It's actually going to drop down from underneath, because underneath the uh, underneath the, the, the rover, there's a, a shield, that sh a heat shield to, to shield the helicopter. It's going to drop that. Then it's going to lower the helicopter. It's going to let its little landing feet pop down and it's going to drop it. And then the rover is going to back away, <laughs> just back away. And then they can start testing the, the parts of it. But um, no date estimate on when they'll be trying that out. Uh, but very excited about that. So the thing that probably excites me the most isn't part of the major science. The major science is, you know, yes, they're testing the helicopter, but the major science is looking for the evidence of past life, microbial life. Um, so that's a that's huge part of the mission there. And of course, the geology of it, the uh, looking, for, um, uh, looking for more evidence of um, previous liquid water and there might be water underneath. Well, we know there's, there's frozen water underneath in areas, but we need to know more. But that brings me to what, it's not the main science, but oh, I'm really excited about this thing. It's called MOXIE, which means it's for Mars Oxygen In Situ <laughs> Resource Utilization Experiment. I know folks get to sit around and dream up these acronyms. It's great. Well, what this is gonna do is um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an experiment that's contained in a, in a box and they're going to attempt to produce oxygen from the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. Now, oh, not enough of it to do anything practical with, but if it works, then they can start working on potential ways to then uh, produce the oxygen that would be needed for future astronauts or fuel for uh, for craft in exploration, uh, exploration on Mars, and to be able to get back from Mars. And uh, if you saw the movie, you read the book, The Martian, I always think about, you know, how the character in that story was creating uh, oxygen, uh, producing it, and thought, hmm, this will, this, this is a good way to be yeah, a good way to come up with multiple ways to do it so that uh, we don't have stranded astronauts. No, we don't hope to have stranded astronauts, certainly not. But um, 
I, I just think this is so great that they're doing this. This is all about the future, the future exploration, and we get to see it unfold. I'm over here showing you web pages that you can check out for yourself. We can all follow this story and we can follow it together. And I'm so excited about this. Now, some other things I want to show you, um, I want to wrap it up because I didn't want to go uh, very long here. Uh, some things that you can check out, some sites that you can go to. Um, let's see. So we're going to be releasing some videos and uh, a few of the ones that I'm going to be releasing, we're going to put them out on YouTube and we'll release them on Facebook, are where I take something, uh, 3D models or uh, texture maps uh, or even terrain model data and I bring it into free open source software so that I can then create uh, scenes from it. And so uh, those little videos are going to demonstrate this, but the terrain, oh, that's my favorite, is from the, there it goes, high rise. Yes, from the uh, high rise cameras. And uh, Oh, of course, I'm already drawing a blank on it, uh, but this is, these are the highest resolution images that we're getting of the surface of Mars from one of the orbiters. It's incredible. If you go to this website, you can look up, uh, you can search for uh, Jezero Crater and find many, many different uh, uh, sets of data. This is my favorite one right here. And you download these files and you can bring them into your own software and do all sorts of really fun, amazing things with them. And there's also maps, interactive maps. So you can zoom in on areas of interest and you can then see where they've taken these high resolution images that you can download. Um, not just images, uh, images, but also the elevation data so that together you can make um, a fully textured 3D model. Just really fun stuff. And um, like I said, I, I, we're going to see in a video that uh, we're going to release uh, probably Monday or Tuesday, where we actually bring this into a piece of software called Blender and create the, the terrain ourselves. But this, this data is there for all of us. You need an internet connection and then to work with these models, you know, it all helps to have a nice gaming computer that's uh, beefy enough to handle the, the graphic side of things, but it's all there. We can explore this data. Now, something I found on one of the, uh, I don't have that link handy, but on one of the uh, um, Mars Curiosity sites was a weather report showing hey, here's what the temperatures have been on Mars for the last few days. And then I noticed that it hadn't been updated in a couple of days. Hmm, I wonder when that'll happen. So then I went to the site for the Curiosity Craft and it said, oh, it talked to one of the orbiters earlier. Well, then I went and checked out the Mars Relay Network. The Mars Relay Network and uh, you can search for Mars Relay Network and you can load up this, uh, uh, this site that shows you all the craft that are in orbit around it, the, uh, the landers and the rovers that are uh, there on, on the surface. And um, well, I'm looking and I don't see, well, yeah, I see that some of them are uh, communicating. So there's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and there's that little symbol showing that it's uh, sending signals. Now, it doesn't always match up perfect, but sometimes I can then go, oh, look, it's happening, to the Deep Space Network Now site. See, I saw that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is talking to Earth. Well, here we now have the uh, uh, I see that on the Deep Space Network, you can see which craft are sending signals and receiving signals to the different stations on the Earth that are keeping these communications going. And uh, so 
the Mars craft. Some of them are ready to communicate but aren't at the moment, and some of them are communicating at the moment. And this one to the left, the EMM is being uh, talked to right now. EMM is one of those other missions, the uh, or one of the orbiters that I mentioned before. So it's the uh, Emirates Mars mission, and the uh, orbiter is called the Hope Orbiter. And uh, now this one was, I had to write the launch dates down because, you know, July was a long time ago, my friends. This one was launched in, on July 19th, and it's going to be um, having its orbital insertion. So it's going to arrive at Mars and go into orbit around Mars in just a few, in just a few days on the 9th is when it's scheduled to do that so it's getting closer but as you can see um we do share communication time with uh with that mission uh, in fact there are a lot of universities i think university of colorado is one of them that has um, uh, um, collaborating with them on that mission but yeah you can check out this deep space network uh you can see what's communicating, uh, where, what uh, uh, kind of communication it's going is going on. You can uh, uh, click around, get information on the spacecraft. You can get the the, the world map showing where the locations are for the uh, uh, the stations here on Earth that are receiving and sending the information. So. It's, it's, it's great things that we have available to us that we can check it out for ourselves. And we just did it here. I can't believe that worked because demos never work in front of people, but nope, it worked. Uh, we saw on the Mars Relay Network that, hey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is communicating right now with the Earth. And then we were able to go and see that it's displaying on the Deep Space Network as well. So a little bit of taste of fun Mars stuff that's coming up. Uh, we have not yet solidified what our plans are going to be here at the planetarium, but we will be doing, um, we'll be having some live, probably through Facebook and or YouTube, but we'll be having some live things throughout the day, um, setting up, uh, trying to set up some little uh, little watch party times where we can have some friends from other planetariums join us as well. Just looking forward to it as a day to celebrate Mars and Mars exploration. Eric, have you been handling questions like crazy? Your fingers are are flying uh, at the keys there. There have been a few. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go back through and see what questions. I are. haven't been able to display that. So oh, not a problem. Not a problem. So Mark had a great question asking about the sound picked up by the microphone um, in the thin Martian atmosphere. And they wondered how it would sound. And uh, because of the information that we do know about Mars's atmosphere and the temperatures and the, and the chemicals in the atmosphere, um, they actually have you know some good guesses but nevertheless guesses are not the same as actual recorded data and that's why it's really great that we're going to learn some more from perseverance um but i shared a link in the chat um that can give you a sense of how different things would sound in the atmosphere uh in short uh the idea is that things would sound a lot more muffled and higher pitch sounds would have a lot harder time traversing the atmosphere um, because of the low density and the fact that a lot of it is carbon dioxide in that atmosphere too. Um, so that's some pretty wild stuff. Uh, let's see here. Mark then asked about how long it takes a signal to get from Earth to Mars. I, I said that it's about 11 minutes because at the time that uh, Perseverance is landing, Mars will be about 1.4 AU away from Earth. Um, and it takes about eight minutes to travel about one AU. So that's where I said that. Steph had asked how long are the rover is going to be on Mars. And I said, well, until we decide to bring it back uh, forever. Um, and yep. there are no plans to bring it back. It's going to be there and stay there, basically. Just like some of the stuff that we left on the moon. So that's just how it goes. These are one-way tickets for these robotic missions. Um, yeah, uh, Jeff said that Moxie sounds like a fake face cream. 
Um, and actually, Moxie is also actually a classic uh, soda pop uh, carbonated beverage from uh, the Northeast, if memory serves. Um, and so there is that. And that was the last of the questions in there. Let's check the Q&A now. Ellie asks, what temperature is Mars usually at? Mm, very cold. <laughs> pretty, it can be pretty cold. Yeah. The warmest temperatures are, you know, can, can, I'm trying to think, what is the highest temperature, like at the equator, summer, at the equator, at, when the sun is going straight overhead, you can get up to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. About and that is at the Celsius. ground. Yeah, at the ground. That's at the ground. Yeah. The atmosphere is so thin yeah. that, you know, an astronaut standing there, yay, 70 degrees, yeah. my toes are happy, but their head's going to be freezing. Yeah, that's true because the air is not able to retain that much heat because of how thin it is. The other wild thing is that um, even though it's so cold, it's not so extremely cold that we don't experience similar temperatures. When we get stuff like this polar vortex that's coming into town, we occasionally have temperatures where we live that are colder than some parts of Mars. Not great, not great. <laughs> I'd rather stay here, thank you. <laughs> Even if we have a polar vortex. Folks, do you have other questions for us? Oh, how many rovers have been launched total? Hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I had my guess there. Um, that we know up for sure. Oh, that's right, all those secret rovers that the CIA sent. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, look at how long it took before we got uh, the information from the former Soviet Union. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that sure. we didn't have until they opened that up and, and, and declassified their stuff. That's and true. given the number of, we've thrown more stuff at Mars than anywhere else i think i mean i think we've yep. even thrown more stuff at yep. mars than the moon um exactly routine now with with those missions and the numbers of failures have been pretty high um but i mean we're also throwing more there that you know we're, we're aiming for mars more than anywhere else so yeah. and i don't know if there's uh necessarily a rush to do it i mean we try to we always try to go every two years and two months, we get that Mars launch window that's mm -hmm. so optimum because otherwise it's going to take, you know, like a, it can take a very long time to get there because right. you can't aim at where a planet is. You have to aim for where it's going to be and you have to um, swing your way around to try and uh, take advantage of gravity when you can because uh, the more fuel you have, the heavier your craft is going to be and that's going to Oh, that's going to mess things up for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that I, we can probably count on the Soviets not having sent any rovers to Mars. Um, and the Russians actually have had some trouble with sending even landers or probes near Mars, because I would have oh. loved that Phobos mission to have worked out, but it couldn't even escape Earth orbit. Um, that was so sad. Um, you know, and the Soviets seem to be extremely focused on Venus throughout the 70s and 80s. And they got landers and they got probes mm -hmm. to float in the uh, atmosphere for a while. That was cool. Um, all right. So Mark asked, what have we learned about what Mars is like and its formation? And what does that tell us about Earth? What would you like to say with that? What's that? <laughs> What have we learned about what Mars is like oh. and its formation? And what does that tell us about Earth? Oh, Mars compared to Earth, it's similar to Mars compared to Venus. We get the contrasts going. So you know, with Mars, we get the example of no greenhouse effects where, you know, as opposed to Venus, where you've got greenhouse effect in, in, in excess. And, you know, with earth, we had, well, it's where we get that Goldilocks thing, you know, earth is just right. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, some big differences with Mars. So we don't have, uh, well, I, wanna, I don't wanna say we don't have, because every time I say, yeah, we don't have tectonic activity on Mars. And then we get, well, not entirely true. Oh, we don't have magnetic field. Oh, not entirely true. So Mars has turned into the land of exceptions. Um, because every time I get set in my ways thinking, okay, no, yes, no, yes, then turns out there's an exception to it. I, I would say Mars is the closer to Earth-like, certainly in potential for uh, visiting, but honestly, I'm not sure other than its uh, distance from the sun and its size being different. What do you think, uh, Eric, as far as the formation goes? Yeah, um, we see that Mars has, uh, you know, considerably lower density, but a lot of that is just a function of it being smaller. You know, um, I know it's about one fourth. Yeah, yeah, it's and and I'm and I'm thinking also about the density and so on. Um, excuse me. Um, so there's just a function of it not having been able to uh, aggregate as much material and not enough iron and with that lack of mass, it didn't compress down nearly as much, not in the way that we saw with mercury. So there's that. Um, and what you said was a great point. We see some tectonic uh, formations. We see lots of volcanic activity in certain spots, but we also see how it was unable to resurface the planet to a noticeable degree um, for billions of years. That's why such a high proportion of the surface is still covered in craters, but you do see other influences. So going back to the Goldilocks thing in that regard, you've got Venus that has undergone complete volcanic resurfacing. You've got Mars that's had partial resurfacing of various sorts. And then you've got Earth where it does it through tectonics, which is really wild. So yeah. Um, Steph asked, how many hours is in a day on Mars? How long is a soul? <laughs> a soul, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, Mars would be a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there because the time everything just takes longer. <laughs> what, you don't think you I'm get, thinking the seasons, though. You don't think you don't think you can get more work done in the extra forty minutes? <laughs> well, no, I was thinking about how the you know the the year is longer, the seasons oh, are yeah. stretched out, um, but there are yeah. seasons because there is tilt. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, what is it? Um, some seasons, well, okay, depending on the hemisphere, obviously, you've got some seasons lasting five months, some lasting four months, some lasting six months, and and that's all a mess. But yeah, but generally, a soul is what they call the day on is what scientists call the day on Mars, and uh, Mars close takes close enough. Yeah, Mars close takes enough. about forty minutes longer to spin than Earth does. Which makes it close enough to be so tantalizingly close enough, but then just off enough that if you're trying to translate back and forth, it'll just drive you mad. Yeah, yeah. And imagine how much of a mess it would be for planning when you're going to do stuff with the rovers. So, or the landers, honestly. Oh, is, is Jeff still on? Uh, ask yeah, him, ask him what the, ask him if Mars has time zones. <laughs> I'm only joking because he was figuring out time zone calculation stuff this week. Oh, no, he says no, no, there are no time zones on Mars. Yet, right? <laughs> it, it, it'll be a question when people have to talk to each other from one to another. Now, um, I didn't, I didn't mention um, the uh, the the third mission, the uh, the one from uh, from China. Um, that one, I, sh I was going to say, it sh it's uh, had to put the dates on my notepad here. Uh, so the orbiter, so it's arriving at Mars, going into orbit this next week also. Um, it's planned for the 10th. And um, it has a lander that is, uh, but it's not scheduled to 
uh, descend until May. Uh, but of course, they may revise that schedule. Yeah, because they're sending a combo, right? Is that yes. what, yeah, that's yes. what you're saying? So orbiter lander, always fun. And they actually had a small camera of some sort that was launched from the craft in transit as a, as a test. So it was it was launched well to be able to you know to, to send pictures of it as it moved on. So um, it sounds like they've got huge plans for future missions as well. And so there's just like with perseverance, um, there and ingenuity, there's a lot of uh, experiments that will lay the foundation for uh, future missions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mars is under attack. Earth is invading <laughs> Mars again. Oh yeah. And uh, the flag. do check out that Mars relay network because mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really fun to be able to zoom in on a uh, on a lander or a rover and to be able to find out oh hey it's communicating right now with one of the orbiters and, and being just being able to follow that now the um, uh, the dates for it only go a couple weeks ahead so uh, let's see right now you can only step ahead in time up to the 15th and when I did that I could see uh, the uh, I uh, say as they got closer, I could see the arrival of the uh, um, the the orbiter the of Hope. Uh, so I could see that one. So they have that included in the Mars Relay Network, and it's it's kind of neat to be able to see that. But they don't have things as far ahead as the uh, 18th. So uh, when you go ahead to the 15th, you can see um, Mars 2020. You know, Perseverance uh, um, the the whole package you can see it getting closer but uh I'll, I'll keep checking it and see if they update the the look ahead as we get closer very cool all right folks do you have anything else to mention to us or to ask okay well, thank you all so much this is so much fun and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. Excellent. Well, folks, yeah, thank you once again for joining us. Um, keep in mind that in addition to our Kaler lectures, uh, we are doing our prairie skies, winter prairie skies right now, every two weeks. Um, and that's out of sync with our Kaler lectures at the moment. So we've got three straight weeks of shows at the moment. Isn't that fun? Um, so uh, you can join us again next Friday at 7 p.m. for Winter Prairie Skies. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you again with the Starco Planetarium.